I'm sitting over here. For attendance, those present are Wayne Adams, Joanna Blanchett, Jill Eichhorst, Lisa O'Connor, Brian Page, Chris Redding, Chris Weil, and Jack Willette, and Doug Jelena is absent. And the majority I'm vote sorry, for Marianne is 4.0. Mm -hmm. Is this, uh, is this, this anybody? Is it a pen, so I'm assuming Jack has it. That's yours. Pledge of Allegiance. Pen? Yeah, right. you have a pen. Pledge of Allegiance. To the flag of the United States of America, and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. I need a motion to approve the agenda. Second. And as far as discussion, we have to make, uh, if we can, amendment to the agenda to add a donation from the Pentucket Education Foundation. Anybody make a motion to accept it? So moved. Second. Any discussion on the amendment? Uh, any discussion? Uh, I guess we'll vote the, the, the agenda as amended. All in favor? Unanimous. Uh, where are we going to place it, Jeff? Um, I don't see anybody from the. Uh, they're not coming. Oh, they're not coming. So can we do number eight? Number eight. Yeah. Thank you. Okay. Minutes. Uh, we'll go through and approve the minutes. Uh, business meeting November eighteenth. Is there a motion to approve? So moved. Is there a second? Second. Uh, as far as discussion, a uh, couple of comments I made earlier to Marianne, and we're going to uh, hopefully correct. Um, on the November 18th business, there is some uh, talks about approving minutes uh, from September 16th. That's a, an item that got left over that should be deleted yeah. on the first page. Mm -hmm. Under innovation schools on the second page, uh, second paragraph down, it references just finance and entrepreneur, and it also should include the STEM, STEM schools. Yeah. I would like to make that an amendment uh, to those minutes. Okay. Anybody else have any further input? All in favor of the motion is amended. Anybody opposed? It's unanimous. Uh, Business Finance and Operations Subcommittee of November 18th. Is there a motion to approve? Second. Any discussion? All in favor of the motion? It's unanimous. Business Finance Operations Subcommittee of December 2nd, 2014. So moved. Second. Any discussion? All in favor of the motion? It's unanimous. Policy Subcommittee, December 2nd, 2014. Is there a motion to approve? So moved. Second. Uh, and I had discussion. For those of here, those of you who were at the meeting, um, I would like to add wording at the end of the meeting. After the representatives of the, the groups left, um, Greg had and our discussion continued on as to how we were going to move forward developing a policy. And Greg Haddon had a question which was curious, and that was, how does he decide who pays the fees? Which was a question that sort of struck me as odd. The problem is, all these groups <coughs> who were at the meeting and sat in front of us don't pay any of the fees. They pay a $30 janitorial fee. They're exempt from the utilization fees. And that is the pol that, that is a significant part of the policy that the subcommittee is going to have to um, address. So I would like to add wording, which I had written out, and I can um, read it and then pass it on to Marianne if it would be acceptable. Uh, after the last paragraph, I would like to add, discussion continued after the representatives left as to how the subcommittee would move forward. Greg had informed the subcommittee that the organizations that we had met with, most of the groups using the facilities do not pay any fee for the use of the facilities, only $30 per hour for custodial expenses. These groups have been considered exempt from the fee schedule. Mr. Haddon is looking to the subcommittee for clarity on a fee schedule. I think that's fine, but I'm not sure I'm comfortable with in the minutes saying, well, after everybody left, I went over and had further discussions. Mm -hmm. so the meeting I, hadn't I adjourned. I understand though. that. So I think if there was confusion <clears throat> then, it should be brought up then. 
as opposed to putting it on meeting that I further discuss after everybody left. I think we were all. I we was all still, had I know part I was still here. I was here and I listened to yeah. it. Yeah. And I know who was listening and who wasn't. But and I, not everybody that's saying they were here were here when I was the conversation was continued. Mm -hmm. So I'm just saying, in fairness of all, that I'm not sure I'm comfortable with saying discussion that may have or should have been in front of possibly everybody to clear up your confusion could have been done. Well, I'm doing it for the point of clarity that I'm not trying to blindside those people who were here that we caught oh, this information afterwards yeah. at all. and I just wanted to be clear that we didn't know that at the time because we would have had a different conversation in that meeting at the time. I'm not sure everybody thought that. I think some people did realize the way it was. Mm -hmm. It was you Can that dominated the entire meeting that kept revisiting the exact same thing. Can, can I try to help out? Yeah. So in the minutes we point out that uh, in that first paragraph, many organizations are only assess assessed $30 an hour for the fee. Couldn't I use some of Chris's language to expound upon that? Uh, because that was my attempt to capture what went on during the meeting, and I can expand upon that a little bit to use Chris's language. I don't know that we need to go beyond the meeting after the meeting was, you know, completed, and that would capture that sentiment that that those factual components. I'll just strike help? the first sentence then. But yeah. I think you need clarity that the charge of the committee is to mm -hmm. figure out how to decide who pays the fees and who is exempt. Yeah. So can't we just add that in? That will add added clarity to my comment. Is that okay? I'm fine. If everybody else is good with that. Great. Because yeah, it wasn't after the meeting. Because the meeting hadn't. Right. Yet. Right. No, I didn't say after me. I said after the representatives okay. had left. Yeah. Yeah. So we can do that. All right. So all in favor of the minutes of the policy subcommittee as amended? Perfect. It's unanimous. Okay. On to public comment. Seeing none, we'll go on to the superintendent's report. Okay. I just want to take a little bit of time with everybody tonight. And a lot of this information you all have because I, I've sent it on to you. Uh, but I want to do it formally so that anybody who's watching our meeting will, will also have the information. Um, we've been conducting uh, uh, two meetings a week for the past couple of weeks, and the meetings have been uh, focused on to what degree are the facilities helping or hindering our educational programming here at the high school. We've been calling them LEAP meetings. LEAP stands for Leveraging Educational Assets in Pentucket. And the last meeting in particular was quite significant because we had conducted a tour of the high school and had established many different areas in the high school that needed attention. To sum up, the, the biggest difficulty is that we never know what's coming, that the surprises are actually sapping our ability to spend our funding efficiently and effectively, and we have to keep reaching into the educational side of our programming to address the physical plant uh, concerns that come up. So in our, um, in our tour, we saw things in real time like the short circuit of a light uh, in the gym. We saw in the apparatus room that there were some uh, significant uh, potential safety issues about um, steam pipes um, in conjunction position next to electrical facilities and um, the, the, those folks from the public who have attended the meeting and we have students, staff, community members, parents, we have a broad variety. Uh, everybody has um, come to terms with it, it may not be a new building and it may not be a reconditioned building but something has to happen to support the facility here at Pentucket High School. So um, there are more details that are, are uh, posted for people to take a look at. Um, but even as early as this week or as late as this week, uh, Greg Haddon, our facilities director, came to me on Monday to say there was a, a leak in the boiler room. They traced it to um, a little leak that was coming out of a pipe 
when they uncovered the pipe, they had a huge steam pipe that had rotted out, and he has to take out a 10-foot section in order to go back far enough to find some part of the pipe that he can attach a new pipe to. Uh, so that work will be uh, being addressed over the holiday vacation time when kids aren't here, when staff aren't here. But it continues to be very, very expensive and labor intensive for us here at the high school. And, um, you know, I just wanted to bring that forward to everybody. I know that some of you have participated in the LEAP meetings, and uh, I didn't know if any of you had any conversation or, or uh, you know, comments that you'd want to bring forward uh, tonight. Um, I know I've, you know, attended the LEAP meetings, and I think Could one thing... One thing that was very evident to me was that um, we're like a catastrophe away, yeah. you know, from, from a serious issue. Because um, right now, you know, high school students are being housed over the middle school due to um, the April flood. And if something else happens to other sections of the building, it's going to, you know, we don't really have any place to put them. Yeah, I think that's one of the things that has come up in the group a lot is that we can't predict what the event is, but we know another event is coming because the, the frequency has just increased to the point where um, we're always just in repair mode here at the high school. Yeah. Um, I would just encourage anybody, if they get a chance to go to the website, and you have a link with the walkthrough of the building, yeah. and it really explains it well of some of the yeah. things that this building is facing. Yeah. And it has nothing to do with the education that the children are receiving. They're receiving a great education, but the yeah. building is just it, taped together with duct tape almost. Well, we're, we're getting to that point. Yeah. Um, we do have a videotape of the tour that's being edited right now. And as soon as that is finished, we're going to post that as well so people would be able to actually go on and take the tour along with everybody else and, mm -hmm. and to actually see the the infrastructure of the building and some of the limitations. So from the science room to the electrical mm -hmm. supply to, you know, I think we, we pretty much toured every aspect of the building. Um, it, we're just at a, a very critical junction right now. Okay, very good. Thanks very much. Alrighty, we're on to new business and uh, innovation schools. So back to Jeff. Okay. Um, it, our innovation schools are really beginning to take off. Uh, last night we had a tour here at the high school for potential uh, ninth graders. So middle school students came and took tours and, and saw some of the, um, the great uh, programming that's available to them here at our high school. And I happened to uh, link on to one of the tours that were provided by students. And the student was going on and on about how he has become so involved in our safety and public service um, innovation school that he had really no idea about that or the fields ahead of this. And now he is really considering um, a career with uh, state police or law enforcement for some of those areas. Um, we have six innovation schools throughout the district right now. And the innovation schools are really setting us apart in many ways uh, from a more generic approach to uh, schooling. Um, and I think that's really fantastic. Two more schools are underway for planning. And what you have in front of you is the proposal or perspectives from each school. One of the schools is um, proposed to be a, uh, the Pentucket Academy for Business Finance and Entrepreneurship. And the other one is for the Secondary STEM Academy. You all know that we have uh, both Bagnell and uh, Page focused on the implementation of a STEM uh, Academy. Theirs is, includes the arts, and so we call it STEAM. Uh, the A is for art. The um, design and engineering focus at the elementary school is proposed to be brought up here to the middle school and beyond into the high school for a 7 through 12 approach. And uh, that not only would benefit students coming from Page and Bagnell, but also the Merrimack students as well. Um, they have a STEAM approach that's built into what they're doing as well. The finance and entrepreneurship is really 
a, a terrific area too that we're trying to build and put together. And Jonathan Seymour and I actually went over and met with some representatives from Merrimack College who are very excited about the potential of, of partnering with us around a finance and entrepreneurship uh, school uh, here again for 7 through 12 students. They're talking about everything from a summer uh, career academy for students in the middle school to uh, early high school and early college credit. Uh, so we're hopeful about that partnership with Merrimack, Merrimack College. We're in the early stages of, um, of uh, talks with them. So I'm just bringing it to your attention tonight. It was approved to go to the next stage for planning. And as you all know, the planning stage will take place and then it will be brought to the public and then it will be brought here to you all for your final approval. So we've still got more work to do, uh, but it is an, another exciting opportunity uh, for students here in Pentucket. So I didn't know if you had any questions about that. Uh, it, the proposal is just a very generic um, overview of, of what the, uh, the staff is thinking about. Uh, the plan will have a lot more detail in it. Okay, thank you. Uh, we are here, Jeff. Institute of Savings. One here. Um, Institution for Savings. Um, bank at the high school. Okay. Um, Kim Rock is, uh, thank you very much for coming. There's a seat right there for you. Hi. I didn't know if, maybe we could go around and just introduce ourselves. We have a, such a limited audience. <laughs> <laughs> Brian, you want to start? I'm Brian Page. I'm the member actual school committee representative. Jack Willett. I'm one of the members of the group one. Mr. O'Connor, group representative. Jill Eichhorst, West Newbury representative. Chris Weil, West Newbury. Joanna Blanchard, Merrimack. Mary Ann Naffa, Administrative Assistant. Greg LeBrec, Business Manager. Wayne Adams, Merrimack. And Chris Redding, West Newbury. Um, I have three girls, and I could see them being involved in some of this, this banking, the finance, that mm. I, I'm very excited about the program. It's a great yeah. step. Yeah, so um, I think it was last fall that actually uh, Kim and some other reps from the Institution for Savings um, asked if we might be interested in actually having an on-site uh, bank here uh, for the Institution for Savings. I asked Kim to come in to just generally describe what that might look like and feel like. Um, my understanding is that other school districts have this feature in them. And I, uh, before bringing the proposal to you formally for a vote, I wanted to give you some um, thinking around this and, uh, you know, if there are questions, you're free to ask questions. So, Kim? Sure, sure. Thank you all very much for having me. Um, currently, the Institution for Savings has five educational offices. We have one at Newryport, Triton, Ipswich, Masco, and Beverly. And the educational office is a full-service banking office. We have to actually apply to the FDIC and the Division of Bank for approval. Um, the only thing that differs it from a a real office that's actually, you know, um, not an educational office is that we do limit it to the students and the faculty. Um, because of the safety of the school and the students is that, you know, we expect that the doors are locked so the public can't come in. At times there are public individuals that actually request to actually come into the school, but they would have to actually sign in the office and have approval to actually go to the school bank. Um, the school bank actually has a, it's run by a bank employee that is actually a um, supervisor who is trained in all aspects of banking. And we run the programs a little bit differently at all the schools based on what each school district actually offers. Um, one of the school districts currently has it as an internship program. So it really works with their career to work fair um, school. The, another school actually has a business department and we work very closely with the business teacher to actually have the students have a finance component in the classroom and then they actually come into the bank and they actually are processing the transactions. They are doing everything that a teller at one of our other locations would actually do. Um, not only do we actually train them to actually learn everything as it relates to teller responsibilities, we go over everything, but it I did several pages long as far as, you know, the scope of what we actually do in all of our schools. Um, 
we had um, the chance to actually tour, you know, the Kentucky High School, and we actually looked at this space right outside the cafeteria as the location for the bank office. Um, it's something that the bank would actually come in and perform, you know, with obviously the school's participation. All of the um, construction is necessary to actually put a school bank there. Uh, the bank would actually pay all the expenses. Um, it would be nothing that the school would actually incur as far as the construction and renovation of the, um, the area for the school bank. Um, the other thing that we actually do is that um, we try to actually find ways that, we have a very strong financial literacy program. And I know that some of you may be aware of that because of the things that we actually do at your elementary schools. Um, we just really want to strengthen our partnership with the Kentucky School District. Um, you know, over the course of the last, I think it's been three years now since we actually instituted the, the scholarship for the graduating senior, we've continued to try to look for ways that we can actually help because we continue to see that there's more and more students that are graduating from high school not really understanding what a checking account is, not really understanding, oh, well, what is a credit card? So, you know, some of the programs that we've actually done just over the course of last year is at the elementary level, we've actually done the, um, the savings, learn about savings, and that's a program that we do at all the elementary schools in April. Um, the other thing we do is the Get Smart About Credit, um, which is a program we offer to all the juniors. And then, of course, the um, Credit for Life Fair, which I think, Jeff, you actually attended last year, which is just the students are just overwhelmed when they actually are presented with, you know, a job, a salary, and then they're responsible to actually go around the room and actually form a budget to actually find housing, get a car, clothing, furniture, everything that all of us actually have to do on a monthly basis. So. Um, we really believe this is just another step that we can actually offer to the Kentucky School District as far as strengthening partnership. Um, and we've spoken to Jeff about your very exciting, you know, innovative school program as it relates to the business and finance and how we can really, you know, partner those two together um, to really have the students that are really interested in possibly going into the finance area begin to understand what banking is all about. Um, and we talked about, you know, not only having them learn the teller responsibilities, but having somebody from our marketing department come in and work with them. Having someone from our human resource department come in and work with them. Um, right across the board. Okay. I can go on and on and on, but certainly I want to be able to answer any of your questions. Go ahead, Jack. Sounds terrific. <laughs> <laughs> Sounds terrific. Just, I don't have a question, I have a comment. Uh, neighboring town had this almost 20 years ago. It was all good. And a good number of students continued in the summer and worked for that bank, and several of them went up in that bank, and I can't think of a negative thing in that community that it didn't work out real well for both. We currently have a branch manager who actually started with us back um, probably 15 years ago, and she actually um, completed the school bank program when she was in high school, as well as we actually have a commercial analyst who actually started at the Ipswich High School School Bank, you know, left there, went on to college, came back and actually worked in the, you know, summer and Christmas holiday and all of that. So I mean, we have a lot of those success stories. Mm -hmm. I'm going to ask, we just talked about the finance and entrepreneurship school. Is the bank intending to um, tie in with that program or is this separate or how does that all tie together? And we're still kind of discussing that when we actually met, um, you know, we haven't really fine-tuned the scope. We've provided you with, you know, our scope of what we believe the program is, how the scope program is going to run, but that's something that we have to complete really together and submit that to the Division of Bank for approval. So that's still in the works. Now, I think tonight is just more or less discussion to see what our sense is. The one thing that was encouraging, you had mentioned it was just for students and staff, whereas I think the proposal mentioned that it was open to the public, which was a little unnerving reading that. Um, so that was good. My other question, I guess, is as a school, with most, most things we have to go out to bid and things like that, and this is a business coming in and occupying school space. Is it, What's been the experience in the other, you said five schools, are there other banks that do these programs? Are you the only one? Or how does this all 
there's been um, the the last program that we actually started, which was actually at Masca, Masconomic Regional High School, and they were required. The school committee required that they actually go out to bid, and they reached out to I believe three other banks, and they couldn't get anybody to actually even. Um, given the proposal. So it's, it's not a money maker. As a matter of fact, you know, it's something that we actually lose money on. But we just truly believe that as a community bank, it really is our responsibility to actually help the kids become educated. So um, the students work for, what do you do, like a one hour shift generally during the day? Each school is a little bit different on how we do it. It depends on if they actually have block schedules or how the schedule works. We never want to have more than three students in the bank at a time because okay. of the fact that we just feel it loses the effectiveness. So what will happen is the supervisor will work closely with the school and whoever the designated school representative is to really put together a schedule. Um, the, I'll just give you, for example, the Triton program. The Triton program has 21 students that actually participate in the banking program. And those 21 students rotate on their schedule. And sometimes it's actually during the banking blocked hours, or sometimes you know if they haven't actually worked in the bank during the seven-day rotation, they'll come in um, during study halls or during lunches and things of that nature. So it takes a lot of time and energy to actually make sure all of the students that are enrolled um, actually get the desired banking time. Mm -hmm. Because again, you want to make sure they get enough credits for the course that's being offered. So, so, so they don't get paid. They get. They don't get paid. They get no, no, no. Course, it's actually course credit. credit. That's absolutely correct. So this is actually going to be a course that's actually in your course catalog for, okay. if approved, hopefully the 2015-16 school year. Okay. So how many hours a week do they are they usually required to be in the bank in order to get the credit for the course? It varies based on your program because again, it's still in the works as far as how it's actually going to work as far as on the school side, okay. whether or not there's actually going to be a classroom component mm -hmm. or whether or not it's actually going to be all bank hours. So that's something that we're still working with Dr. Mulqueen and um, Jonathan on as far as the details of that. Okay. Mm -hmm. so, uh, the other thing that we do is that, you know, the, the students that actually want to actually participate in this course, they have to actually complete an application. And the reason that we actually have them do that is that we rely very heavily on the guidance department to make sure that these students actually meet the qualifications. Because keep in mind, you know, they're going to have access to account information. Okay, so they're going to have access to a lot of private confidential information. And you just want to make sure that, you know, these kids are mature and responsible and can handle that. A lot of yeah, um, when it came to going out to bid, you know, I don't see any costs on Pawtucket with taxpayer dollars. So, Greg, can you follow up to see whether or not it so is something you, I don't see well, it no, as being a bid? Well, what it is is it's a benefit to the it's bank a benefit. by yeah. giving them free space in your building, which means if you're going out to bid, you have to say the Pawtucket Regional School District seeks proposals from local financial institutions to open up a pseudo slash prank <coughs> in the Pawtucket Regional School District and see if anybody's interested. As long as you do that. And you put a time limit you, on. You so put it out in the paper, yeah. they have to respond within, you have to be at least two weeks, okay. and then they, you, they're the only respondent, you've met the standard. So do you think that's something we should follow through on? Is that something sure? that we need? You have to. Well, yeah, if, you, if you decide that this is a proposal that you guys wish to do, that'd be the, the first step, obviously, is yes, you have to go out to bid. All right. Well, Kim, can I jump on you one second? You'd mentioned you had five other schools, and you said Masco had gone out to bid. Did the other four, did they just? They didn't. <laughs> and nobody. And, and keep in mind that with the other one, for instance, when at the time we actually um, opened Triton, it was when um, TD took over Bank North and they were closing all of their school banks. So it was something that was actually, you know, Triton actually said, are you interested in actually um, opening the office here? And we did it. Okay. And I know that one thing that we actually do, and it may be something that's required by the school system, is that in all of the agreements is that we actually say we pay a dollar each year um, for the space. So that may be something that is required with the you know, mass educational, you know, I don't know what the actual requirement is, but that is something we do. It's nothing different than consideration. It's a dollar. It's just to put a monetary component within the part of the bid. But um, yeah, I mean, it's they should go to bid. Yeah, <laughs> you should do that. Take right. Jack and then Wayne. I have no problem with going along with institutional saving. The early bird gets the earworm. They, they, is there any law? I mean, we know that. Absolutely. 
Yeah. <laughs> That's what we have to worry about. Do you think they like writing ads and bid packages <laughs> and proposals? I mean, we, 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 we hear that there's five banks, and they only had to do it once. Can, well, can we call the Department of, Ed of uh, we, we can find out. Education we, and find we, out? We can find out, Jack. But what, what you heard from Kim is that there's not a lot of competition out no. there. So yeah. That's right. It's yes. a, it could be a fairly quick and easy process. I mean, you think you're, you're offering basically free <laughs> space within your building. You can't just pick someone and do that. You have, you have to go to bid. The only bank that I'm familiar with that actually even does it any longer is um, Havel Bank, I believe, actually has an office in um, Havel High School. Oh. Yeah. Isn't Wayne? Well, I am confused. Yeah, we <clears throat> and correct me if there's been a lot of changes, it seems to me when I was pseudo involved, mm -hmm. no bid needed to go out, whether it was for the entire town or the school system, unless there was a minimum amount, from my understanding, from the bank that this school had. There was no money making proposition in the first place, so I'm certainly the laws at that time would nullify any open uh, conversation. It's the, it's, the value, it's the value of the space. <laughs> That's, that's what you have to put a monetary thing on. We can ask council. That's an easy question. That's yeah, I'll get clarity. Real simple. I mean, if you say the normal rent in a place is two thousand dollars a month for this type of an argument, that's twenty-four thousand dollars a year, and that certainly falls within the realm of you're going out to bid. The limit's ten thousand. But it's not. It's so, not the public. But we'll well, we'll, we'll get clarity from council. It's not really. It's not a point to. It's, it's not going to be We're not going to settle yeah. it. Yeah. 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 If it needs yeah. to be done, we'll do it. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> Lisa. I wanted to leave on a positive note. We will. Funny. We will. Because <laughs> yeah, it's awesome. I just said, well, I did have one question, if it's can, okay, guys. Can we grab, um, I was going to grab Lisa first. But oh, I'm sorry. I didn't know she had a um, So we're having a company come and rent space in a building. Do we have to go to the town if we rent? I mean, we have a lease for the building, correct? Not this one. No. Oh, okay. So not the high school. Okay. Um, and my other question um, was, is there going to be a teacher in the program, I, I understand that there's somebody from the bank in the, in the, in the bank, but is there going to be a teacher as well? That's the part that we have to figure out. Okay. So ideally, this would be rolled into our finance and entrepreneurship, um, you know, innovation school. Mm -hmm. And uh, there, as you heard, there are lots of different models, everything from it's part of the curriculum to it's really just a standalone branch. So. You know, uh, our preference is certainly about rolling things in so that it, it makes more sense yeah. to everybody. So we'll figure that part out, and we can also get, you know, the last word on whether we have to go to bid or not. The bid part to me isn't isn't uh, a big deal because that's a, a just a standard procedure that you can go through. It you know, it's not it's not anything uh, terrible. And my last question that I had. Um, gosh, I hope I don't lose it. Jump to Greg and come back to you if you want. <laughs> yeah. I'm I just sorry. had a real quick question. You did say it was, it was open to the public, but they could sign. What, what kind of public activity do you see in the other ones? None. <laughs> <laughs> because, again, it's something, because, again, it's actually something that we have to apply to the FJC, right. the Division of Banks, for. Yeah. It's, it's a bank. It's yeah. a bank. So, obviously, you're there to service the customers. Sure. You're there to deal with the public. Okay? Um, we, as I said, we do restrict it at the educational offices because of the, the safety of the students. That mm -hmm. you know, because the doors are locked. Mm -hmm. You know, anybody that actually comes in that wants to actually go to the bank would have to go to the office and request that they actually be allowed to go to the bank. We never have it happen. Okay, no, no, that was so my, I was just picturing a to group tie in with his question because I was reading through everything here and this. This represents it would function as a bank open to the public, and it talks about you'll do checking, savings, loans. You would actually do loans? I mean, the kids aren't going to... We actually will accept loan payments. I mean, if somebody actually wanted to go in there and actually open a deposit account, they will be able to actually open a deposit account. They will not be able to actually go in there and sit down with a loan officer okay. and actually do a loan application. We would advise them that we could have a loan officer come here if they didn't actually want to go to one of our other offices, or we would actually have them actually do an online application. Okay. Okay. Back to Lisa. <laughs> and my, my last question was um, in regards to privacy, well, the students will have access to information. So, what information is it that they have access to? Like yep. other, other people that, that belong to the bank that, that I'm That's absolutely correct. Just like a teller would. Just like a teller would. So, basically, um, prior to them actually being able to actually even sign on to the system, there would be a number of bank policies that would be reviewed 
reviewed with students as far as conflict of interest, code of ethics, professionalism, all of those types of things. And that's why we so heavily actually rely on the guidance department to make sure that the students that are actually enrolled in the program, you know. Um, They're the right fit. Exactly. Yeah. Okay. Oh, I'm sorry, just, Brian. I just Thank wanted you. to clarify. You're talking everybody throughout the institution for savings accounts, absolutely not just correct. here. That's absolutely correct. Because okay. they're tied into the system. <laughs> it's a branch. System. It's a branch. Yeah. Go ahead. And keep in mind that, you know, as with any teller, I mean, they're restricted to actually looking at somebody's account based on the individual that's in front of them based on the transaction, okay? No teller is, you know, and it's something that we monitor on a regular basis, is allowed to actually go out and say, hmm, I wonder if my neighbor has an account and start typing in names. Okay. So just for clarification as far as that, as far as um, we take classes. <laughs> so forget about it, Brian, okay? <laughs> <laughs> no, I was a little, ner I was yeah. a little nervous. <laughs> Just, just because what she said, I mean, you know, next door neighbor, you know, yeah, no, we she's take got a new car last week. So is this usually a one-year course? Like, yes. so just for seniors or just for juniors? We typically actually, you know, limit it to juniors and seniors. Um, okay. Just because of the fact of age and maturity. Yep. Um, we tend to most, uh, most times we actually have seniors, but we have had students actually enroll in it for two years just because they enjoy working in the bank. They're just, they continue to learn, you know, after, right now we actually have, I believe, six um, weekend tellers at our offices that actually are students that actually work in the bank program. So Monday through Friday, they work, you know, at one of the school offices, and then on Friday nights and Saturdays, they come to Henry Reporter, Salisbury, Ipswich, and actually work in those offices. Oh, wow. So, we've had a lot of discussion. You get a good sense of what it's about. Mm -hmm. And uh, Kim and I will continue to uh, figure out how this will all fit together, and then we can come back to you with more information at, you know, as we move forward. Sound all right? Mm -hmm. okay. okay. Well, thanks so much, Kim. Thank, Thank you very much. much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Energy steps. Update. And Mr. Hatton is here because uh, I wanted to make sure that any questions that were represented, <laughs> Mr. Willett, <laughs> that we had the right answer here for you. We've actually got, beyond the little report that you got, we got some more information for, for you tonight. Did everyone so. see that little yes. print up of the temperature mm -hmm. setting? Yeah. Yep. Yeah, I liked your commentary on old boilers. <laughs> Older boilers. <laughs> Newer. Newer. And ancient. Old George. Didn't go to ancient. Just to kind of capture some stuff on that yeah. front page. That's we're trying to squeeze as much savings as we can out of our systems at each school, and that's highlighted on the front. And keep in mind that even though we did some significant upgrades, we didn't upgrade the entire heating system. Just updated some portion. The only two buildings that have an entire upgrade is Sweetser, which they got from the Green Program, and the Page. The Page has a brand new heating system top to bottom. But all the other schools have had various levels of work, which captures some savings. But with, again, we're trying to squeeze it and cool things up at night. But we don't want to go too cold because we can't catch up the next day. So we're struck down. Uh, for, on the back of that page, on the second page, we have exterior lighting and interior lighting. And my school have highlighted how things are set up. Some things have mechanical time clocks, some things are on photo eye light sensors. Uh, some, some schools have computer control lighting that goes on and on. And I've tried to highlight that. Usually by 11 p.m. at most places, everything is shut down. On the interior lighting, we have many different systems. We have motion sensors, regular wall switches, motion sensors on the ceilings, computers. I could really get lost into what is in what building. But again, if you drive by a school at night, there's very few lights left on. We're trying to save where we can. Probably the most important part of this thing is the notes that I wrote down. I can say this in all honesty, that at all schools, wherever there was an incandescent light bulb, 
the old fashioned light bulb that we all have in our homes. We have converted to these, or these. And these are LED style. So as you walk to the high school, if you look in the kitchen under the hood, or you look at someone's office, wherever there's a screw in bulb, we, we replace it with this. We actually obtain these in bulk from a vendor who just sells LEDs at a very good price. I think retail, this is about $10. We got them for about three. So it was well worth that investment. Where I hope to take us with LEDs is this wonderful thing right here. This is a replacement bulb for one of these overhead lights. This is an LED tube. It requires no ballast. A ballast is a device that's in the lamp that's a transformer. The transformer excites the fluorescent tube, you get light. Well, this device, pretty much if you plug these two tabs right into the wall socket, this will light and continually burn for up to 10 years. 50,000 hours, 24 hour day. This, when I bought this, oh, a little over a year ago, this was $55. And it had that warranty. It's got all the endorsements from everyone who would sanction a good light bulb. Currently, this is down to $25. So the LED price is dropping. And it's becoming a good investment that when I have to repair one of these, I just convert it to LED. And I'll probably never go back to that light again. These come in different colors. You see bright, <coughs> bright white, as you see here, and then you get soft colors, soft white, soft yellow. We're going with the bright white because it gives a good contrast to reading, and it doesn't bother a computer screen. So I'm hoping to get to a price point where this makes good sense, as opposed to putting in three bulbs in a ballast for about $50 in parts. I can just put two of these in. That's a good right when the price point gets to the good spot. Um, just to talk a little more on the notes, the middle school up the hill was checked for a performance contract about a year ago. We brought in the Amoresco company, the same company that Merrimack Valley Planning Commission has contracted with in the town of Merrimack. And they looked at all of our consumption, our energy bills, gas, and electric, and water, and they determined that the middle school is not a good candidate for a project because there's not much savings to be obtained by investment. So it's a good school as far as energy consumption. Then we've also enhanced that with the new boilers up there. So the middle school is pretty good. Uh, one problem I have with the site that you should know, it's very difficult to quantify an energy project because the high school and the middle school are tied to one electrical meter. So it's hard to discern how much juice the high school uses. It's hard to break that down. There is no way to do it that's accurate. The universal way to do it is by square feet. This is 208,000 square feet, and that's 115. So that's really not a good way to decide how energy is being consumed. So that doesn't help us. We, we have to break these buildings up electrically to get a good project. The Donahue School has gone through a performance contract with the town of Merrimack. That's this document here. And what's happened at Donahue is they've fixed a lot of the heating controls. They put in a computer system to control that. The computer system is controlling the lights in the classroom. There's motion sensors. There's water savings, devices, low flow toilets. They pretty much went in and audited the building and then made these upgrades. And made these upgrades to obtain the savings. This takes a while to capture these. You don't get an instant gratification. These savings will take a few years to realize and they start to pay off. It's a slow start, but there is some new equipment over at Donnie that's helpful. And through all the MSBA green programs that we've done at the elementaries, the one investigation of the middle school, with MSBA, we squeezed every nickel we could out of these places. Between roofs, roof insulation, high quality windows, uh, low E windows that uh, retain heat, and heating systems. Again, the Suites has got a new heating system. Middle school has new boilers. You should come up and see them. They're 
they're really nice. <laughs> Bagnell has the same boilers as the middle school, so we have some lightness in the materials. Age's system is, well, had you seen the old one, you'd really appreciate the one. <laughs> I've seen the old one. <laughs> yeah. old so we've, 20. we've squeezed pretty much every now. So that's that's an overview that mm -hmm. we're trying to manage and maintain the savings. Mm -hmm. uh, we are in this is a unique program for Page. We're in discussion with the West Newbury Energy Committee, Rick Parker, and he had applied for a Green Communities Grant with Massachusetts DOER, and they were accepted. And we partnered with them to a point that we could, even though we're a separate entity, we're working with the you know, system or whatever. And uh, we're trying to work out an arrangement. We're very close to completion where we could upgrade the Page School with a significant amount of LED fluorescent fixtures. Because that school has gone through a few renovations, there's a whole mixture of lights in there. This style is surface mount, wall mount, the sconces, it's suspended on changes. I mean, it's like a, an electrical supply house because there's so many renovations. <laughs> but the West Newbury's committee is eager to help us and give us some assistance with the grant to get us an LED conversion. In this early discussion phase, we're looking at, I'll try to describe it to you, all the hallways in Page long hallways down the center be converted to these. The library and the adjacent rooms, there's a computer room off the library, the library is significant size, all LEDs. The kitchen, the kitchen is unique because it's a high ceiling, so to install one of these and not have to go back up and change bulbs way after the I kitchen retire. Or the, the, the kitchen is a good thing. The kitchen or the cat? The kitchen. The, kitchen. the cafeteria is new has a high efficiency lighting design, so that's not a good candidate at this time. All the stairwells of Page, if you've ever climbed those stairs a few times, you'd appreciate the lighting in that. And they're also looking at the exterior of the building. If you drive up to Page at night, there's this massive floodlight on the Children's Castle, and there's a few lights out back, and they would be converted to LED also. So that's the scope of the project. Very close. I should have resolved by Christmas. And if we accept and we join with the uh, Energy Committee and we do this, we have to finish the work by the end of January, this January. If we attain that date, then West Newbury qualifies for a much larger grant than Energy Grant. So there's a significant savings by doing this at Page quantity that they're offering. So I think it's possible. Mm -hmm. And there's no cost to us for money. There's no cost to us for labor or management. It's mm -hmm. just the grant. It's done. Mm -hmm. So that's good. Do uh, you have any energy questions? Jack? Jack? I'm sure Jack might have one. <laughs> will, a, will a company come in and convert page school from the old PH to the LED? That's the intent. No labor on our part. No, let them in after hours. They start at 3.30, they go home around 11, and when the job gets done. Beautiful. It's done. Beautiful. We're hoping to close that and complete it real soon. Well, and then it's less maintenance work after. Mm -hmm. We're not these touching burn, these ever again. We won't touch that light again. So the advantage of these is you're not repeatedly changing lights, changing ballast. And when you take an old light down, that's actually hazardous waste because of the mercury content. Mm -hmm. So you eliminate all this downstream work. Question. Pretty much this, I need about nine of these to burn the same amount of electricity that one of the lights above us. So it's about an eight or nine to one ratio on electrical consumption. And you can't tell. I have a few of these in central office. So if you're interested to see how they look, there's a couple different styles. But well, and the other good thing is, they don't break. Because it is a gavel. So when you, it's a gavel. Uh, Careful, it Jack. the floor, it won't break. <laughs> Where a glass tube is a safety hazard. It doesn't yeah. have a cover. These 
these actually are pretty robust. You twist them, it's not. Huh. You have more questions, Jack? You look like you did. Yeah, question. Uh, <laughs> Greg, could, could Roland nice. and West Newbury, Merrimack. Uh, Merrimack, apply for, to the Department of Energy for the same kind of grant? Page yeah. took the initiative and did? No. I'm not so sure because West Newbury's Energy cool. Committee is getting some assistance from National Grid. Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah. National Grid has endorsed a certain type of light that carries all these warranties. So they're going to get some assistance from Grid. Groveland and Merrimack have in their own light departments. They don't offer any assistance. They're not going to get any break on the product. And that's kind of the catalyst that we have now. We get the reduced price, right? We're getting a break. Yeah. It's also oh, no, we're getting lower price, I know that. It's yeah. also a green communities grant. Mm -hmm. Mer West Newbury's achieved that status with Northern Merrimack Heaven. There's a whole series of requirements you have to yeah. go through to make a process. They spent a long time. It's too yeah. high for Groveland and Merrimack. You have to buy like national <laughs> natural gas cars and stuff, Jack. Oh, they'll never go over it. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> it, it's hard to get that. It, it's but a lot of work. It really it's, is. It's, it's quite an accomplishment. In, if you achieve the steps, you get larger and larger grants. West Newbury could really get some big benefits. Rick Parker's done a great job. Oh, he he has. has. Chasing a lot of that stuff down. Can I ask a question? I'm not sure if you sort of indirectly addressed it. Uh, Merrimack had that program with Amoresco. Mm -hmm. And somebody snickered. <laughs> they were going to have. An update on that. the, that's what I want is an update. They were relamping everything. We, I believe, contributed. And there was a guarantee return on the investment. What's the status of that, and has it achieved uh, the results that were anticipated? <laughs> we probably haven't seen the full savings they promised. But the security of a performance contract is that when you sign an agreement with Amoresco or another vendor, Amoresco is our vendor, they tell you what you're going to get. They design the system, they install it, they manage it, they control it, they set the temperature, they set the clocks, guarantee you you're going to get those savings. So if you don't get the savings that were promised, they pay the difference. That's, to, that's to follow up, is somebody monitoring that and then no. adjusting? To follow up, I've talked to Carol over in Merrimack. These guys are monitoring it very closely. And they is also, as part of that deal, was a consultant, an independent consultant was going to do the review, and she's contacting them now to begin the process of seeing if what was promised was being attained. And what is the time frame to get an assessment on that? Uh, she was. I talked to her about two weeks ago, and it was on her radar screen to begin to deal with. But Merrimack will take the lead on that. It won't be us. Did you need a year's so. worth of qualified data? So we just finished six months ago with all this work. Yeah. We're not ready to start. Okay, the data it came company. to us a long time ago, so it took them a while oh, yeah. to get the work done. Okay. Time, lead time, okay. Contracts. But you need a year of solid data to see if they met their goal, yeah. and then they're held accountable for the difference. You can't contract, you can't lose. And you get some new stuff. Well, I'm just making sure somebody's going to monitor it once it's yeah, done. No. Yeah, Otherwise, they, the contract's I've, not. I've spoken to Carol about it already because, I, I, like Lizzie's saying, you don't see it yet. And I'm kind of, hmm. <laughs> well, to hear that they just finished the build up, you need yeah. to get your information gathered. That makes sense. Well, this is yeah. our first full season. Okay. Anybody else have any further questions? Thanks for coming, Greg. I appreciate Greg. it. I appreciate Thank all the work you put into the update, too. Can he lead you before we get to the next part, or should he stay? I'll let him go. Okay. Okay. Jack, Jack, if you text me, I'm not coming back. <laughs> yeah. I got my answers. Okay. Great. Thank you very much. Um, Greg, are you in tomorrow? Yep. I need you to sign some stuff tomorrow. Principal search, Bagnell School. Yep. Uh, so um, I've provided to you the process and timeline, the description for the career opportunity that we published, all the representatives uh, who will be participating on the Bagnell Principal Search Interview Team, and um, all this information was published out to parents today and, and staff members, uh, so we're scheduled for January 12th as our interview day. Uh, we received 43 applications. And I've gone through all the applications and selected out the top to interview. So I, I think we're in good shape. You said you presented the information to us. Where was that presented? This one. It's right here. 
right. Okay. It was in the packet left on the desk tonight. Yeah. It was left on the desk tonight. Yeah. Okay. That's why I hadn't read it yet. Yeah. So this was a, uh, this was just sent out to staff and to parents tonight, and um, or this afternoon. And so I've given you all a copy of the information so that you have it as well. Thank you very much. You said two who selected out of the party five. No, the top. Top. How many? Uh, I, oh, I thought that too. I okay. thought it was two. Huh? No, no, it's not the top two. No, I know, but top you said few. A few and it sounded like two. Yeah, top few. Yeah, so uh, we usually bring in about five or six candidates uh, to interview. And then from there, we whittle down to, you know, maybe the top two and bring them back for visits and. You know, that sort of thing. When I thought I heard two, I was a little curious. That would be a curious number. No. That would be a little selective at this point. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. So, yeah. So, I, uh, we were pleased. We were, you know, initially we had in here preferences for candidates with uh, advanced degrees in licensure and in um, school adjustment counseling or special education credentials, that sort of thing. And we usually put those things in you know, hoping to get them, but we had a, about 12 applicants who had all of that additional certification and experience. So we, you know, I was really happy to see that we had a, a good pool. Are they from all over the country? No, uh, typically, yeah, and in this case, we get a couple, like now I would say two, who were from the far reaches, uh, you know, of North America. But, um, <laughs> Alaska. <laughs> well, you know, I think I got one from Arizona and I got, you know, so I look at everybody as a, a potential candidate, but um, everybody who uh, is in the top pool for interviews is more local than that. And we didn't have to go beyond the local area to get some good candidates. Yeah. Were there any internal candidates? Like yes, I have uh, an internal candidate who will be interviewing, yeah. So more information to come, you know, but I want to give you the latest and greatest on the search committee. Thank you. Okay. okay. Uh, item number five, E&D expenditures and transfers. So maybe Greg could take this one. Sure. Uh, at the last business and finance subcommittee meeting, we went over, and I know there were some other guests as well, we went over, we have received our E&D certification for fiscal year 14. Uh, under the new E&D policy that you passed, that means our new process is to spend it on one-time projects that do not affect ongoing budgets or down assessments. The uh, items brought forward to you are what we considered to be, we will, after talking to people throughout the district and the employees, things that we really needed to have right now, with the balance of it, again, under the E&D policy, to be put into our stabilization account for savings. Uh, as we're going out to bond in late January, early February to tie up all the projects from the MSBA, the grounds projects and things, one of the components of that is a ratings call. They want to see that you're taking care of your capital needs as well as not spending all your money. So putting some in a savings account obviously will help us towards our ultimate bond rating, what these bonds go out at, which reflects our interest rate. So what we're hoping to do is bring it for the full committee tonight and vote these items to go forward. Um, the first four items are majority vote, as it's just expenditure. The fifth one, which is transfer into a stabilization account, requires a two-thirds vote of the committee. Also, if you ever wanted to take money out of stabilization, it also requires a two-thirds vote. So, so we'll vote each item individually as we do it then, mm -hmm. but yep. I have two questions. Number one, just for clarity. Uh, number three. Yeah. Item number three, that number should read 32,120. 32, the other item per the minutes of the subcommittee said you were taking $200,000 and using it for 2015 budget? Yeah, that's, that's part of the 619000 that was originally certified. When we did the fiscal year 15 budget, $200,000 of that money fell into that revenue stream to support this budget. Also under the new E&D policy, that is the last time we will do that. From now on, every year will stand on its own. And that, with, that in total with these numbers and Equals negates RE, out the total E&D budget. Brings our, brings our e &D down to exactly zero. Okay. I'm just asking because otherwise mm -hmm. we would have $200,000 deficit. Jack. Question. The E&D account is for the entire district. 
correct. The stabilization is only for the high school and middle school? No. Nope. It's Pentucket's stabilization account. Okay, and what's that account? It, well, I mean, it, it's an emergency account. Most, right. li it most likely it would only be used at the middle high school because the amount of anything needed would most likely at the elementary levels fall to the towns because it would exceed $10, most likely ten thousand dollars. Right. So almost all, I would say, if something bad happened and we had to deal with it, it could be, but most likely it will always be used at the middle high school campus. In the regional agreement, it says mm -hmm. that we shall ask the towns for money for the stabilization. It says you can make that a part of the assessment request. It doesn't say that you can't put your own money back into it. Yep. Yep. This is the same procedure we lose at the end of last year when we got 13 certified. We had that little $32,000 left around or whatever it was. And we began the 20, process of... I think it's 24. Was it 24? <laughs> yeah. At the end of the day. It begins the process of, once again, I mean, for a district our size, we should have a significant stabilization account to protect ourselves from... Some any, catastrophic Some event. catastrophic event, and we don't have one right now. So this will begin the process of us, again, building us up to a point where you could go to sleep at night and, you know, if something bad happened, you could... You have a mechanism to take care of it without significantly affecting the operations of the district. How much will this leave us in the ENG account? Zero. We're moving the balance of the E and D account over to stabilization, Jack. That's where the money is. You're supposed to zero out the E and D account, correct? Why are we? You, can, you, can, you don't have to. It's 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 what we talked about doing from now on. So each year lives on its own. Mm -hmm. Right. But why are we zeroing out the E and D account? Because it's in stabilization. Bringing it down to zero. Yeah. Under law, we can have five percent of our budget. You're talking about no. You're talking about how much you can keep in stabilization, right? We can keep five percent. You can keep up to ten percent. Yeah, the five percent, Jack, for E and D is how much of the budget you can capture. That's the the oh, maximum for the yeah, budget yeah, that you can capture. We've captured, and we've captured two hundred thousand, right? But, but it doesn't say that it has to stay there. Yeah. It, it, that's how, as much as you can take out of the budget, though, for right. E and D. It's still there, though, Jack. There, I know you're talking about there's a limit you can get to before you have to start returning money to the cities and towns. Yeah. Mm -hmm. That's what you're talking about? Yeah. You're not even in that you're, you're not even in that gravity field. <laughs> to worry about that. <laughs> <laughs> like, I, I'm I'm just I'm just wondering it must be the administration's Well I mean if you left this to hundred and thirty if you left the hundred and thirty five thousand to twelve, say you did this and you left that in E and D, you could you could not transfer it, but it dies. On June 30th, it's gone. You have to wait for another recertification. It will add it to right. next year. All this does is keep it available to you in the right. same format, being invested in an account that draws its own interest and stays with the fund, and, and gives you the ability to take it out. It basically puts it under your control instead of on June 30th, waiting six months to be recertified again to put it under okay. the state's control. Yeah. Well, one of the things we discussed at that meeting, mm. there were two things that I brought away. One is that, what was our stabilization like years ago? Like 19, nothing. 19 grand, yeah. yeah. So the fact that we're building up that emergency fund, especially with the high school campus, yeah. you know, everything, things rotting through and stuff, I think yeah. that's a good thing. It's, it's you're putting into a savings account mm -hmm. that can be used if something were to happen. And the other thing was that the, um, it can't be used for operating purposes or for, no. for I can't no. buy staff, so you can, we're not so buying staff, not, so not buying paper. So leaving it there doesn't necessarily do anything for us. And like you said, when we're going out for these new bonds, it's just going to help us having a higher... Reduce our rate, right? Yeah. yeah. And our stabilization is like way below what it should be. Oh, sure. Anyways. Your, so, yeah. Your stabilization should be, you should be north of a million. Yeah. But... We're sorry. just south of a million. Just south. So. <laughs> just way, way below the equator. <laughs> we're below the equator yeah. on that one. Yeah. Antarctica south. <laughs> so. Anybody have any further But we're, we're trying. We're trying. We'll get there slowly. So we slowly. want to vote, the, vote these items separately? Mm -hmm. Yes, Or please. can we vote the first four as one and then the you stabilization? Could, you, could, you, could, you could read the first four as one to say the following I'm not forward. sensing any resistance, so I think it's probably simpler and cleaner. Okay. <laughs> if that's what you'd like, sure. So um, I'll make the motion. You tell me if it's the correct motion. Uh, to see if the school committee uh, will expend from fiscal 2014 years certified uh, excess and deficiencies funds an amount not to exceed sixty thousand dollars for the purpose of replacing the middle school refrigerator and freezer, uh, one hundred thousand dollars for the purpose of upgrading district technology, thirty-two thousand one hundred and twenty dollars for the purpose of purchasing safety manuals and procedure books, and 
$92,200 for the purpose of purchasing the following pieces of grounds maintenance equipment. A $73,000 tractor loader with attachments, a $4,200 groomer with attachments, and a $15,000 turf top dresser. Correct. Is there a second to the motion? Second. Any discussion on the motion? All in favor of the motion? It's unanimous. Make the second motion, which uh, keep in mind will be a two-thirds vote, but I don't think that's a problem. Uh, to see if the school committee will vote to expend. Transfer. Transfer, sorry, thank you. From fiscal uh, year 2014 certified excess and deficiencies funds, a transfer in the amount of $135,212 to the district stabilization fund. Second. Is there any discussion on the motion? All in favor of the motion? It's unanimous. Thank you. Okay, emergency response plan. Okay, so you have uh, some documents near or in front of you, and I'll go through, I'll tell you what that means, that are draft documents that just came in that will be reviewed tomorrow with the police and fire chiefs and my school administration. And I just want to share with you what they look like so that you can anticipate them coming through. So one document is this big one. So you, you have a big document that says emergency operations plan on it. It would look like this. This is the shared document. So every other person's got one. So Lisa's got one. Brian's got one. And you can share with your neighbor. I, at a point tonight, I just thought, I'm not copying all of these because i got to collect them all from you anyway. What? These because are draft documents. Now, can I hold yours up? No. Oh. <laughs> you are so oppositional tonight. This is what it looks like in color. This is what yours would like look like if I didn't have Jack Willett's voice in my brain when I was on the on the copier <laughs> with color. So um, wow. this is what it will look like. It will have um, this format with the tabs, and you'll be able to. Um, tab up to see all the different kinds of uh, emergency sequences and how to respond. The one you have in front of you has been Pentucketized. So that's the draft document that I have to go through uh, before tomorrow afternoon and prove. My principals are doing that, my chiefs are doing that, uh, chiefs of fire and police. We're all collaborating over this to make sure everybody is in agreement and uh, and happy with the document. So uh, this will effectively bring Pentucket to, if you want to uh, ever want to talk about world class in Pentucket, this will bring us to world class for the emergency operations plan. Um, it is uh, a, a widely renowned plan uh, for being uh, state of the art. It has the newest uh, procedures recommended from the state police. It has, um, you know, it, it's just a, tr a tremendous plan. Um, the companion part of this, you also have in front of you, everybody's got one of these. It's the narrower looking uh, piece. Yours doesn't translate into what this looks like. This has little tabs that has all the information like you all have in front of you. So you have the, the copied components, so it doesn't look quite as nice. These are the, the uh, components for secretaries, for classrooms, for anybody. These will be distributed like candy. So everybody knows what to do in an emergency situation. And again, uh, it goes from everything uh, from shelter in place and lockdown to powder, power outages, um, bomb threats, missing persons. You name it, uh, there is a, a handy dandy index here that will help a person to manage through that. So, the combination of these two uh, will bring Pentucket very quickly to a new high level of, um, of planning. So, the next part will be we've got to uh, train everybody in how to use these. Police, fire, and school district personnel will be training together. We'll be doing tabletop operations, simulations. Uh, classroom teachers and office personnel will be training now using these new tools. And uh, 
once we proof them tomorrow with everybody, uh, the plan is to get them to the printer, and by the end of January, we'll be distributing these and, and uh, we'll be taking a next big step. In addition to these emergency operation plans, we're piloting something called COPSYNC. COPSYNC is an emergency communication tool that allows everybody who has it either on their computer or cell phone, every adult in the district, to initiate an emergency and notify the, the local police, not only at their dispatch, but any police cars that are in the neighborhood would also immediately be able to respond. So it reduces communication very quickly. And um, it'll, it's a communication tool, so if we evacuate the building, uh, anybody who has it on their cell phone would be able to communicate. So Jonathan would no longer, for instance, at the high school, be using you know, verbal communication going from group to group. He would be able to initiate this using a texting device, and everybody would be able to uh, see what we're doing in real time. What's that called again? CopSync. CopSync. Yep. Okay. C-O-P-S-Y-N-C. CopSync. It's a 911 operation. Mm -hmm. And um, that, too, is, uh, has been adopted in the state of New Hampshire. And um, the company, the phone numbers and everything, I don't want to get to the point where it gets printed and somebody says, whoops, we should have looked at that. Yep, so I have all the phone numbers here. These are all confidential. Um, these actually, I can show you. This little insert tucks into the, the um, beginning page right here. There's a little plastic folder that's inside. So this annually is, is uh, yeah. updated, and every school would be able to insert their own individual information here. But so even all the municipal numbers you've got in mm -hmm. here. So yeah, we're going to go through all of that. I just want to make sure that. somebody proofs it before mm -hmm. it hits any printer and that everything yeah. is 100% correct. Definitely. Okay. Yeah. So this has all been accomplished very quickly, and there could be errors here, but we're going to look through it all and make sure it's all uh, appropriate. So with the COP sync, I was able to um, see that when I went to the conference in November. Down at the Cape, right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. And um, I was extremely impressed with it. And it was good because it keeps everybody on the same page. Everybody can communicate, even teachers that are on field trips yep. um, can communicate and know right away that something's going on and that all those kids are accounted for um, and everybody knows where everybody is. Mm -hmm. um, my question was, it's, it's being brought in as a trial, so at what point, is it a 12-month trial? Is, is, when does it start? When does it finish? When do you make a decision? We have a year from when we adopt it, so as of tonight, we have a year to try it out, to put it, bring it in and try it out. So by next budget cycle, we'll know if we want to move forward with it or not. What cost is it if it goes in the general budget? It's, um, so it's about, uh, ten thousand dollars for us this year and it's a reduced cost once you implement it okay. so once all the training and everything has come in there's a, a reduced cost of about twelve hundred dollars per campus okay. I think it was like sixty one seventy two or something like that yeah something like that so you can never put a price on safety yeah so it's um, somebody has you know so it, it's not a tremendous cost to us and it would it would give us a, a really added benefit but again, I want to try it out and make sure we work all the bugs out ahead of really uh, committing to it. Yeah. yeah. Great. So if you could put all of these or just leave them at your place, I'll collect them at the end. This is, um, again, a draft document. It's hot off the press. We'll be going through it uh, beginning tomorrow. Yeah. So if we can just leave them in the middle of the table, that's great. Perfect. Ready. Um, Next item on the agenda is Whittier representative from Groveland uh, opening. So uh, we got a, a letter from uh, Whittier to explain that the representative from Groveland uh, will be coming to conclusion with that term. And uh, there was some information in the letter that Chris and I thought might be important or that raises some questions and, and uh, you know, so that's where we are right now from what I can see. I'll throw out my thoughts yeah, if you want because I've sure. made some notes. Mm -hmm. um, and I express this to Jeff. I, I think what I would like to do is, is take a two-fold um, process on this. And the first one is 
they, in the letter, the superintendent of Whittier has enclosed the part of the regional agreement that defines how the members uh, for the Whittier School Committee are, are assigned. And there's a couple of problems there that I, I would like to get clarification on first. And it states that um, two members from Haverhill and Newburyport, and then one from the other communities comprise their school committee. When I went to their website, it's a little problematic because Amesbury actually has two members yeah. on the Whittier School Committee. Yet, true, yeah. if you read the agreement, it does the agreement that they've given us. It doesn't provide for that. So I would like to inquire about that as item number one. Item number two, um, it lists Boxford as a member community having one member, and yet there is no member from Boxford on the committee. So I'd like to find out about that. And then the third issue, um, it, it states uh, the members from the respective uh, city or town, and such members may be, but not, but need not be a member of such local school committees. So that sort of started me thinking, um, and I guess the question for the superintendent of Whittier, if, just for informational purposes, of their current members, how many are also members of their local school committees? Because I, I think it's probably valuable to have our representatives to Whittier preferably be members of this school committee so that our perspective can be um, transported to Whittier and then Whittier's information can be brought back to this meeting because there seems to be a bit of a void there and I think we can do better with that. Um, so I don't know how many of the other towns do that. So I would like to ask those three questions, and then I would like this committee to consider that as a, uh, a process going forward, is to, to first and foremost look at members of this committee as Whittier reps before outside uh, parties. Most other times when we have um, somebody ask for a member from this committee, it's somebody from the committee versus a, a a representative outside of the committee. So just a thought. Well, yeah, I mean, that last part you say, Chris, you sit on the collaborative which you're giving the perspective. Of. Right, but the collaborative, see, this is where I disagree with, in a way, what you're saying, because the collaborative, Pentucket, is a member of the collaborative. Mm -hmm. I would say that Whittier, it's West Newbury, is a member of Whittier. Like, I don't think it necessarily is Pentucket that, but ha that has the relationship. the thing is, they're not elected the officials. Towns. That's the difference, mm -hmm. I think, though. We're elected officials. We have to run. We have to get no, but representation. You're not understanding what I'm saying. I'm no, saying I, I that the town, saying. Yep. I think, would be the one who has that decision making. But we appoint, don't it's we? The, the right. school committee makes the appointment, not but the But I think it probably has been complicated with regional school districts. I think what mm -hmm. probably the original intent was that. Uh, is that the town would have a member on the right. board? So I would think we would have to go to the towns to make sure that they're okay with that. And then I would have to say we would still have to publicize it mm -hmm. to outside people who might be interested. And typically there's only one. But I think, you know, when we're looking at the education of students, we're a comprehensive school. And that's kind of where, where we're at. And we have to also make sure that that other piece that Whittier offers is what should be offered for students who are seeking that. So I, I think that, you know, we're right in appointing the people to make sure that you know, people who are there for the students are on that board and not just, you know, um, somebody with, with an issue, uh, you know, or something. Uh, um, I, I don't know. It's, it's, we're elected officials. We, if there's five or six people running, you know, you have to go and talk about what, what your vision is for the schools and things like that. Um, but, but um, I don't know. I, I think it's really important that the school committee we take uh, take a more not a more serious but a deeper look at this than we have in the past. Mm -hmm. So, Chris, I love what you're doing and bringing some of these things to our attention that maybe we didn't always uh, I didn't always understand. Yeah. yeah so I'm just reading here in what Whittier states, and it says the member the members of the Whittier school committee from each city shall be appointed by the local school committee. Yeah. So they set up that language a long time ago, apparently. But no, but I'm just saying that I think yeah. that there's a different relationship that we need I to see. be aware of. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I that understand. we've already kind of gotten them mad at us already with the, with the open house thing. And I don't want to, I personally, 
don't want to appear that we are trying to, I don't know the right word for it, try to, try to make trouble. I do agree that if one of us wanted to be on that committee and there were no other candidates, then why not? But I think we're going to run into trouble if there are outside candidates and we take a spot. Mm -hmm. Jack? My, my concern was also, Chris, I, I, I know that Amesbury, uh, because they would name the city, that's why they were given another member. But, it, but right, they haven't the updated agreement, their wording. It doesn't say that because it refers just to Amesbury and the other towns mm -hmm. shall have one. Uh, it would be interesting to find out, is this this was in the letter, Jeff. Mm -hmm. Okay, so this is this is currently they haven't changed their charter or anything. Mm -hmm. Okay, the second thing is, to my recollection, I thought that the selectmen asked for people who want to be a representative. Mm -mm. No, uh, for for our committee, like when Joanna came in. No, 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 no. We in the past, I know Groveland. Had, in the past, you've contacted the selectmen and said, did you want to put out feelers if anybody's interested? Very in good, right. Mm -hmm. Now, is that just a courtesy? Or mm -hmm. do we, have, we don't have to do it then? Okay. You put notice, like Marianne said, you put notices in the paper. Okay. Can I, I mean, this is, I'm just going to say this and I hope I'm not overstepping my bounds. This, this is the school committee's appointee and mm -hmm. you have every right to appoint people who you think will do the best job, including giving them an interview. It's no different than if you were a selectman and you were appointing someone to a, a finance committee. You'd interview them and see what, because you expect them to perform in a certain way. Mm -hmm. you know, will you follow all the laws? Will you follow? The, you have every right to do that, whether it be a member of your committee or someone you interview from a town. And you expect them to be honest with you and you expect them to do what they say they're going to do. So, I mean, because we're responsible, of, because we're appointing. Because you're the appointing authority, absolutely. Okay. It's an interview process. Well, and I hope that. There'll be a transmission of information both ways with that representative sure. as we, you know, Chris now comes with her report, which was helpful. And mm -hmm. I think we need mm -hmm. more open communication, and that's what's lacking. Right. So, mm -hmm. yeah. um, I don't know if we need a vote, but can we get a consensus if it's appropriate to ask those three questions? Is, is why does Ainsbury have two members? Where's Boxford member? And I would like to know if, you know, how many other members of Whittier are on the local school committees. That might be helpful. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I think it's appropriate. Uh, Yep. Okay. We'll I've, I've asked some of those questions in the past when I was in my other job and got answers to two of the or three. Well, we'll ask again. Yeah. <laughs> you, you have the list in front of you. How many towns are on that? Because if it's 13, it's wrong. It should be 11. Well, I'll do, uh, Haverhill, in the report. Uh, Amesbury, Boxford, Oops. Georgetown. And they're not listed. Oh, hang on. Here they are up here. Yeah. Amesbury, Boxford. Georgetown, Groveland, Ipswich, Merrimack, Newbury, Raleigh, Salisbury, and West Newbury. Twelve. Is nobody counted as I read? I think I got two, twelve. Three, two, four, three, four, four, six, seven, eight, nine. Yeah, Boxford. Ten. Ten. I got ten. Yeah, I got ten, ten too. Ten. Who got the two cities? Who got Haverhill oh. in the report? Yeah. Twelve. Yeah. Thirteen. Fourteen. They should be fourteen members total. Save on Newbury Port, get two votes, it says. Well, they're not members, that's just votes. I think how many towns, yes. cities. Okay. All, 12 towns, 14. There's only 11, 11 towns in, in there. I think that's probably why Boxford's missing. Is Boxford no longer a member? It may not no. be. There's they, only, no, they used to be 13, and now there's only 11. Two were pulled out. They should update no. the agreement. Okay. Okay. So, do we get the consensus? Okay. Yeah, I think there was consensus to okay. ask the Everybody question. shook their head. Okay. Yeah. Uh, okay, item number eight was the agenda item that we added, which was um, Pentucket Education Foundation is making a donation. So we want to thank um, the Pentucket Education Foundation for all of the supplemental titles that they're providing to the high school. Um, the um, particular course is around genocide and humanitarian response, and uh, their support of $770 will go a long way in, in helping our students. So we just want to be uh, very uh, open about our gratitude for their continued support for Pentucket. Thank you for that. Yep. Um, we have to adjourn this meeting first or we go to executive session? No, we go session. to executive session. Okay, so.
purpose is it for? It's right here on the agenda. Okay. Yeah. Uh, so we do have a need for an executive session tonight. Um, make a motion. Uh, we go into executive session to discuss a strategy with respect to collective bargaining or litigation if an open meeting may be may have a detrimental effect on the bargaining or litigating position of the public body and the chair so declares, which I do. Is there a second to the motion? Second. And to roll call vote. Ryan? Yes. Lisa? Yes. Jill? Yes. Myself? Yes. Yes. Wayne? Yes. Chris? Yes. And we won't be coming back. And we won't be coming back. Okay. Thank you. No. I'm shivering. I couldn't even. Did you read the policy? She didn't want to warn the reporter.